Great. Um, welcome, everyone, uh, to the East Side Freedom Library. Um, I, I can't resist making a quip that probably 40 years, 30 years ago, uh, during the Hormel strike, we had a concert with Arlo Guthrie uh, at one of those major venues in downtown Minneapolis, and someone said, if the cops came and sealed the doors, the Minnesota left would be set back generations. And, and so it's great to see you all here, and, and hopefully you can, you can still go out and do good work uh, after this evening. Hi, Gary. Um, I'm Peter. I'm not a comedian. Um, and I'm the co-executive director, co-founder here of the Eastside Freedom Library. And I know some of you are here for the first time, so I'll just take a minute um, and say we, we are um, about five and a half years old. Um, this is a historic Carnegie uh, Library building, um, and I do like to say that um, this we should thank uh, the immigrant iron miners and coal miners and steel mill workers who made Andrew Carnegie a rich man. Um, they're the ones who paid for this building, and it's really great for us to now be here and to do our work uh, here. So the Eastside Freedom Library is dedicated to working at the intersection of labor and immigration, the intersection of racial, economic, and social justice. Um, we're in the most diverse part of St. Paul, for those of you who have ventured across the river from Minneapolis. Um, this is a neighborhood that was, um, of course, once Dakota uh, land, and Dakota people were driven out, and one immigrant group after another, beginning with Swedes, um, has come here. Um, now it's a neighborhood that is probably 40% Asian American, both Hmong and Karen, um, is uh, Eritrean, Oromo, and Amharic, um, is Mexican, Salvadoran, and Guatemalan. Um, and we want to be a place where uh, as we say, the past and the present are in a conversation uh, with each other. So um, it's been my good fortune to know Jean for a couple of years and um, uh, to get some sense of his fascinating history and experiences. And uh, we have sort of threatened each other several times about doing an event here. And, uh, and now we, we finally are. Um, so, uh, let's see, logistics, there are restrooms uh, downstairs. Um, if the stairs are challenging for you, there is an elevator. Um, we're very fortunate that the building um, has an elevator and is completely accessible. Um, so, and there are flyers around for uh, upcoming events, um, lots of different kinds of things going on here. So I'm, I'm going to ask Gene to introduce himself, and then we'll get rolling. And we promise to have time for you to ask questions, give speeches, whatever you might feel moved to do. Gene? Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Good. Um, I'm glad to be here. Uh, I unexpectedly even see some former students. And I said, no, nah, not really. And yeah. So the, the power of the St. Paul Press, I guess, that, that advertised it in Peter. As a literary event. As a literary event. Who knew? Yes. Who? Um, my name is Gene Young. Uh, we moved to Minnesota in 1973. Um, where I started work as the principal of a new junior high that was being built in the north suburbs, St. Paul. And uh, I was going to stay, we were going to stay here for a couple of years. Um, we were going to, I just finished my doctorate at Columbia, and we were going to teach you Minnesota Hayseeds 
recently fallen off the turnip truck, how to run schools and how to get organized, and we've been here since. Um, well, um, now that I'm out of I'm out of the school biz, uh, and I see one cl closer. Um, better too much. Now that I'm out of the school biz, and I, I enjoy watching the controversies going on, and I enjoy revisiting them because we were arguing about the same things uh, 50 years ago, 40 years ago, mm, 30 years ago, 10 years ago, uh, and hopefully someday, someplace, the nice people of Minnesota will decide that um, if you want good schools, it's, it's going to cost you something. And, uh, you know, once that happens, if we get enough positive things, we can do things for kids, including poor kids, and, and give them some decent educations, but that's not going to come cheap. And passing amendments and all kinds of things doesn't answer the questions, but nobody asked me. So. Um, Peter said, do this as a story. People like stories. So I will tell my family's story and my story as much as I can as a narrative and feel free to interrupt and, and correct and, and argue and do whatever. I, I'm not going to acknowledge it, but um, feel free to, to do it anyway. And I have a cohort here, Barry, who he and I share some similar kinds of things at the same time, and so he's certainly welcome to chip in. And uh, I'm sitting here, my wife will also go like this at various times, saying, you're, you're telling too, too much. <laughs> and so that will happen too. I'm going to start in 1887, which is a wonderful starting point because that's when my maternal grandmother and grandfather were born in the city of Vitebsk in what is now Belarus. Then it was all part of greater Russia. And uh, the thing that made Vitebsk famous is that a few blocks away from where they were born, a man by the name of Mark Chagall hmm. was born in Vitebsk in the same year and my grandmother and grandfather knew Mark Chagall. They grew up together, apparently. And uh, when things started getting hot in 1905, and I'll get to that, uh, Chagall sort of hightailed it off to Paris and other places. And, and they came here. They came to the US. My grandparents were heavily involved in the Russian Revolution of 1905. <laughs> and told some interesting stories about that, those events. And this was the first Russian revolution. This was the first revolution to break the power of the czars um, at a time when much of the world and much of Russia and much, much of, of Europe was beginning to question uh, czarist authority, the authority of kings, the authority of royalty. And they had a lot of stories about some peripheral things that happened during this, this revolution. The revolution ended up with the, with the government uh, actually forming a parliament in 1905 for the first time in, 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 in decades and generations, and the beginning of the breakdown of the absolute authority of the czars in Russia. But being in a little Jewish town, uh, of Vitebsk, she, my grandmother always told me some interesting stories. She said in the 1905 revolution, they attacked the rabbis and the butchers because they were in collusion. The revolutionaries. Okay. Um, by then, by 1905, there was already a pretty well developed socialist movement going on in, in Russia. The same movement that ultimately would uh, in 1917, 
uh, create the Russian Revolution of 1917. And so in these little towns, these little shtetls in, in uh, Eastern Europe, the rabbis and the butchers were being attacked because you had, the only time you could have meat in these small towns, in these Jewish towns, was on Friday nights, on the Shabbos, uh, where you, had, you, you bought a chicken and you had the, the family dinner was a chicken dinner. And of course, if you wanted the chicken, it had to be a kosher chicken, and you could only get it from the kosher butcher. What made a chicken kosher was that the rabbi would say a bracha, a prayer over the chicken. It had to be slaughtered in a certain way, but most chickens at that time were slaughtered now. You had to say a prayer over the chicken. So for the rabbi making the prayer over the chicken, the price of the chicken doubled. So as soon as the hostilities and the, and the, and the fighting and, and so on broke out, the rabbis and the butchers were, uh, you know, pretty well. And, 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 you know, fiddler on the roof, who's the rich guy in town? Is, 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 uh, is the butcher, is Lazar Wolf the butcher? Why is Lazar Wolf the butcher the richest guy in town? Because he had to buy meat from Lazar Wolf the butcher, and in order to get that, the, the rabbi had to be included. Well, the 1905 revolution was successful to a degree, but for the, those, the socialists, the radicals, uh, at, at that time, they sort of had to go undercover, and my grandparents sort of traveled around, and ultimately, in 1910, ended up in New York City. Um, and they settled in Passaic, New Jersey. Passaic, New Jersey, and its next door neighbor city, Patterson, New Jersey, was the center of the uh, silk and textile manufacturing. In fact, in 1926, there was a very famous strike, and I'm sure, Peter, we have a lot of stuff here on the uh, oh, yeah. famous Passaic textile strike of 1926. And my mother came here. She was born in 1906, and she graduated high school at a very early age, like 15, um, and entered New Jersey State Normal School, uh, uh, which was in Newark, and after two years, got her teaching certificate, and at age 17, she was a licensed teacher in the state of New Jersey and began teaching in Garfield, New Jersey. And most of the kids in her class were the children of immigrants and strikers and people, the workers in this textile industry. That takes that part of my mother. My father was born in 1904 in a little town in what is now the Ukraine called, Vite, uh, called um, Vishnitsa. It, Vinitsa, I've seen it on maps. It's, it, the, in Yiddish, it's Vishnitsa, which is the capital of the, of the Ukrainian province of Podolia. And you all know about Podolia. Um, and his parents were middle class. His father, my grandfather, owned a lumber yard. Um, which was a good middle-class uh, occupation. Um, he was well-educated. He went to the local gymnasium, and after he finished in the uh, gymnasium, which is the equivalent is, uh, of a, a gymnasium, is like the last two years of high school and the first two years of college, they sent him off to start his education in uh, the Polish city of Lvov. Now, in those days, all of that area was part of something called the Pale of Settlement. It was part of the Russian Empire where Jews were allowed to live. And so there was a tremendous amount of, of movement between what is, now, what is now Poland, Ukraine, Russia, and so he ended up in Lvov. But as a result of all this movement, uh, including, including being part of, of Germany at, at one mm -hmm. point, he was very good at languages. And one thing I always knew about my, my father was he spoke besides Yiddish, he spoke Russian fluently, he spoke Polish fluently, he spoke German fluently. And that, later on, when he had a lot of political activity in the United States, and he came to Minnesota, one of the reasons he was such an attractive candidate to the Communist Party, uh, as who sent him out here to do organizing, was he could go to the Dakotas, he could go to the Iron Range, he could go all over this area organizing and speak to the workers in their native languages. And that was a very, very important asset. 
In fact, several times, the Communist Party snuck him out of the United States back to Russia to be a translator at party congresses because he could translate English, German, Russian, Polish, Ukrainian, and that made him a very, very valuable asset. Um, Right after the Russian Revolution, remember my father was 13, 14, 15 during the years of the Russian Revolution, so he was not an idle bystander. He knew what was going on, and he, we talked about this occasionally. He, even in his little town, which was not where, not, not St. Petersburg and not Moscow and so on, the Russian Revolution was taking place in 1917 when my, when my father was 13, 14 years old. And so he knew what was happening, and he was very politically savvy, and uh, was, was quite well aware of what was happening. When he went uh, in, in the 1920s, uh, early 20s, um, there was also when Ukraine became independent for a number of years, a whole series of pogroms, which were attacks and, and uh, very vicious attacks, including many murders of Jews, when Ukrainians had their, their freedom, they, they celebrated their freedom by trying to kill off their Jews. Um, and one of the reasons the Nazis were so successful during the Second World War, if you know your Second World War history, was because they had so many collaborators in places like the Ukraine that as the Nazis would come into an area, they would enlist the help of the local uh, Ukrainians or Poles or Romanians or whoever were there who all saw this as a wonderful advantage to get rid of those damn Jews once and for all. Um, so his parents, who had some money, as I said, sent him to join a couple of uncles who had come to the United States a few years earlier and sent him to the United States and he arrived in the United States in 1922. And I'm going to pass a few things around and I asked Peter if I pass some stuff around will I ever see it again and he assured me that I of course would. So we have it all on video. So it, 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 not only is it all on video, I, it's carefully secretly cataloged. <laughs> so this I figured I'd start with as my father's passport. It's in Polish because he left Lvov and it shows that his arrival here and the passport's in here, don't open it, but here is his arrival stamps into the United States in 1922. You can start that any. Dad always talked about what radicalized him. Um, as I will explain later, when he was put in jail in 1951, and, they, and the government, U.S. government tried to deport him, back to Russia, and I'll get into that whole story. He wrote a autobiography. It's a little fanciful in some ways, um, but I will read what he has to say about his radicalization when he got to America. Here is how it happened. About 28 years ago, and this is written when he was in jail in 1951, when I was 17, I found myself near a picket line in the New York Garment District. This peaceful picket line was brutally attacked by cops with nightsticks and on horseback. I was terribly shocked by what I saw and it reminded me of pogroms on Jews in my native village in the Ukraine. As I tried to help a bleeding woman picket, the cops pranced on me and I got my share of clubbing. I sought refuge in the lobby of a building and as, and as I was standing there, bruised, bewildered and crying. Some people talked to me, but I remember one middle-aged man in particular. I do not recall exactly what he said, but I remember distinctly that he's giving me a piece of paper or a card on which was printed an invitation by the Church of All Nations, located on the southwest corner of 14th Street and 2nd Avenue in New York City, to come and listen to speakers and lectures on subjects, the meaning of which I couldn't quite grasp yet. I went there, and although I couldn't understand most of what they were talking about, my interest was aroused, and I learned to like these people and their spirited debates. During the day, I worked as a cutter's helper on ladies' dresses, and later in other trains. He, his best job, he said he liked, he was working in the Eagle Pencil Factory in New York. He said he, he really enjoyed working in the Eagle Pencil Factory. He just stood there watching them put the leads in the pen. Um, in the evening, I would go to night school and on weekends. 
I would attend lectures and listen to speakers at the Cooper Union Institute, the Socialist Rand School, and elsewhere. I became a very active trade unionist, and when other workers asked for help, I responded, as did many other enthusiastic and devoted young working people. I was especially active in the needle trades, which is how he ended up working and organizing in New Jersey. And there he met my mother. And um, she was, as I said, teaching in, in, in Garfield, New Jersey, in Passaic, and, and whatever. And they were organizing and working together. And in 1927, they were married. And they weren't married in a traditional ceremony, of course. Barbara's laughing. My wife is laughing. Because the fact, it was not, of course, it wasn't by a rabbi or, or anyway. It was in a communist wedding. Mm. And the communist wedding was basically two people saying, do you? I do. You're married. Um, it, was, it was because it was equality, women equal to men, there was no obey, there was no all this other kind of thing. That's how you were married. And uh, so I admit, and, and you know, most of my life, my, my brother, my younger brother was also very upset about being a bastard, but he, he, took, it, he took it much worse than I did. I, I was sort of, people have been calling me that my whole life, and I figured, why, why dispel that, that illusion, you know, for them? Um, but, but he was, he, he was very upset about that. Um, my mother was also active. Um, and she became more and more active in the you know, garment workers, textile workers, uh, and together they stayed in New Jersey for a number of years. My grandparents by then had moved, you know, were, were also very involved uh, in the union movement. My grandfather was an architect, a builder, and uh, he built this huge house on Howe Avenue in Passaic, New Jersey. There were, there were seven kids, and um, my, only two of which were born in Europe, my mother and uh, my, my Aunt Seal. The rest were all born in the U.S. And um, they were all inv involved to varying degrees. Um, they all went to college. Um, they all had college degrees. Um, they all were, you know, they spoke English fluently and, and taught and, and involved. And, and uh, there was there were social workers. There were uh, people in all kinds of helping uh, trades. Um, and things pretty well stayed that way um, until the very early 30s. When my father's activity, he was heavily recruited during the 20s and became a member of a number of communist youth organizations and belonged to a number of things, and I'll pass this around. Now, my father's name at this point, my father's birth name was Lev Potitsa. And when he came to America, he Americanized it. He was now Leon Platt. And here's membership cards for various organizations the International Labor Defense, which was a radical group, and you probably know a lot more about the International Labor Defense than, than I do. Um, here is a uh, membership card in the Young Workers Communist League of America. Now, here's my father. It's 1950, he's being hounded by the FBI, and if you were smart, and here's the height of the McCarthy period, wouldn't you get rid of all your stuff? They were pack rats. I still don't know how I have this stuff, but I have their cards. And you ever heard the term of a card-carrying communist? Here's his Communist Party membership card. It's the, it's the red one, appropriately. Um, and it's dated 1231, 1924. So as early as that, he was a card-carrying member of, of the, the Communist Party. And you can pass that around. And he was, as I said before, he was sent out to Minnesota, again, primarily because of his organizing ability and organizing skills, but also because of his language proficiency. 
My mother was a trade unionist, and she was very much involved in the International Ladies Garment Workers Union. She came out here with him, and they helped organize the Munsingware plant. And the Munsingware plant was, as you know from your Minneapolis geography, was this gigantic building, almost entirely women workforce. And uh, she and the Garment Workers Union organized this. So I'll pass this around. This is her, all of her official cards and the International Ladies Garment Workers Union, members of the Minneapolis and Hennepin County Central Labor Union, all of which dated 1936-37. And some of you may find these cards interesting too. And I will send around in another direction of pictures. This is my dad taken around the mid-30s and my mother taken in around the mid-30s. So if you want to see what they look like, this is who they look like. And I'll stuff this around. So. Fanny. Francis. Yeah. And, uh, and, and I have a newspaper article here, which I'm not going to pass around. It's a little delicate. This is from the Minneapolis Labor Review, November 27th, 1936. And here is my mother standing over Mrs. Elmer Benson, who was the governor of Minnesota at the time, sewing the first union labels from a building, a factory that they organized. And those of you who are interested, this particular building that was being organized by the Garment Workers Union was in the Boulevard Frocks Company, 510 First Avenue North, Minneapolis. So I have this, if any of you want to see it later. Interesting reading. And, and the wife of the governor, think of this, the wife of the governor, right? Can you see Tim Pawlenty's wife sewing in the first union label right now? Um, Showing in the first union label, I think. Okay. So what did my father do in Minnesota? Again, I'm quoting him. In 1934, I lived and was very active in the agricultural states of Minnesota, Iowa, Nebraska, North and South Dakota. The American farmers were then plagued with mortgage foreclosures and forced sales of their land and chattels because they were unable to make payments on their debts and interest. This is the height of the depression. The Dust Bowl had certainly decimated the upper Midwest by this time. Something had to be done about it. The American farmer is a great stickler for correct legal procedure. But when he did not want to be driven off his land, which his great grandfather cleared in the days of the Indians, the following took place. On this day when the farmer was to be sold out and the sheriff came to do his duty for the bank or insurance company, the farmers from all around would also come. When the sale started, the sheriff or his deputy would ask, what am I bid for this cow, this horse, this thresher, this plow, etc.?" The first bidder would say five cents, the second seven cents, and the third would offer a dime. After that, there were no other bidders. At the end of the day, the entire farm would have been sold for $12. The money was paid, a bill of sale duly issued, and everything was legal and according to Hoyle. Then the farmers would in turn resell the farm with everything on it to the original owner for the same amount, for $12. The movement was known as penny sales, and it spread like wildfire, to all prairie states. I do not know whether the legality of such a sheriff sale would stand up today in the present U.S. Supreme Court. How prescient. However, one thing I, it did do, it stopped the foreclosure by banks and insurance companies and forced the government to declare a moratorium on sheriff sales of farmers' property because of his inability to meet payment of interest and principal on his mortgage. After that came other farm reform legislation, and tens of thousands of American farmers saved their home state, uh, homesteads and escaped the fate of being Steinbeck's Okies. Um, he was also out here involved 
to some degree, I don't know the extent to it, and, and the trucker strike of 1934, which was a major Minneapolis strike. I know he tells stories when Floyd B. Olson was governor of them bringing cows into the uh, rotunda of the Capitol building. Mm -hmm. uh, is that, that oh, yeah. You know, yeah, those things, yeah, yeah, he, yes. he was involved in all those, yes. those kinds of, of things. And for, he later went on to do organizing work, uh, went back east, did organizing work for the Steel Workers Union in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, um, and later for the Transport Workers Union in Philadelphia. And he worked in Philadelphia with a man by the name of Mike Quill, who was very sympathetic, a great labor organizer, and together they organized the Transport Workers Union in Philadelphia and later in New York City. And the, the Transport Workers Union was lily white. It was mostly made up of Irish. And, and they uh, integrated it. They made sure they were very insistent that there were a lot of black unemployed, uh, that, that they could get in jobs here. And uh, he was active and involved in these unions um, up until um, the late 40s when at the height of, of the McCarthy period, you know, just beginning, it was the, the Smith Act days and I don't think, 1947, 48, all the unions in order to survive had to fire all their known communist members and organizers. Um, and about that point, he was really started being hounded by the government uh, and they tried to deport him. And one of the reasons they tried to deport him was somehow in the midst of this whole thing, even though my mother was a naturalized citizen, he was never, he never got his naturalized citizenship. He thought all along, because he came to live with his uncles and he was involved and he got certain papers, whatever, that he was a de facto American citizen. And he found out that he was not, and there was no way in 1948, 49, that he was gonna be able to get American citizenship. And so they tried to deport him. And it's interesting, where did they try to support, deport him to? Well, first of all, obviously, they wanted to deport him to Russia. And Russia at that time had a practice that they would not take American deportees, especially American communists. They had enough of their own, and, and they felt that they certainly didn't need a few more. Um, so then Poland, and Poland was in the, was, was in the, in the Russian uh, severe at that point, so they didn't take any American communists either. They eventually even tried to get him deported to Israel because he was a Jew. Well, Israel, under the right of return, by 1948, would, they, would take, they would take all Jews. And even Israel didn't want him. And so by the time they went through all these Eastern European countries and Israel and all this, and they, they couldn't deport him. And it was at about that time in 1951 that uh, the Supreme Court declared the McCarran Act under which he was being held and prosecuted was declared to be an illegal act and the case was dropped and the government had to go. Why did they bring the cows into the rotunda? Your turn. <laughs> uh, to pay their taxes so that they, they didn't have cash and, uh, and said, well, then they would bring the livestock and ask to expect the government to take the livestock. It was, it was a cash cow, thank you, Barry. But it was some very good theater, some yeah. very good political theater. Yeah. My father went back and forth to Europe. As I said before, he was, he was being uh, used as a um, organizer. And when he came here, eventually he, they were, it was getting a little hot for Leon Platt. Mm -hmm. And they decided it was time for a name change. <laughs> and here was, here is a birth certificate for Martin Young. <laughs> Date of birth, September 19th, 1904, 69 to Plain Street, Chicago, Illinois. How did they do this thing? Well, anyway, this particular Martin Young birth certificate is signed appropriately by Michael J. Flynn, county clerk of Cook County in uh, April, whatever, 1937. All right. Anyway, he became Martin Young. 
This is why I'm a young and not a plot or a platitza. Um, what they would do apparently was, you know, the, the Communist Party was an underground organization, what was an organization that had vast networks of all kinds of things going on. And what they would do is they go through obituaries and they would find the names of people that, that, were, that died recently, got their papers, they, they, they mm -hmm. could have been sympathetic to and got all kinds. And so they had all of these papers and, uh, and people would assume their names and their birth certificates and their things. Now I know my father got back into the United States twice. They had to smuggle him back in. Mm -hmm. Once was through Windsor, Ontario, into Detroit. That I heard hit that story. The other time was they got him into Chicago somehow, some way. And it may have been across mm -hmm. like Michigan. I don't know how, how they got him through, but, mm -hmm. and this is where he picked up. So here is, here is a genuine birth certificate signed and sealed by the Cook County clerk uh, in 1937, testifying that Martin Young was born in the city of Chicago in 1904. I was always wondering over the years that I knew my dad's birthday was, was June 19th, but we always celebrated it on September 19th. <laughs> I guess that's what it says. He was born on September 19th, 1904. Anyway. He, uh, my mother stopped working pretty much after I was born, and then I had a younger brother. Um, but my father kept working in, in the union movement. Uh, when were you born? 1941. Thank you. And uh, so they, they, they became uh, involved. Um, in 1951, he was arrested and tried to be deported. Um, and his defense committee put out the Committee for the Freedom of Martin Young. And here's a picture of me and dad. Uh, and this is a story about Martin Young, an American by choice, age 46, husband and father of two school-aged children, wage earner, neighbor. And here's his story. I'll pass that around for those of you that want to read it. Um, when he left, when he was out of jail, they, and I remember the story, every, during that whole, you know, year and a half that he was in jail, I was in the fifth grade or sixth grade, fifth grade, sixth grade, and every Saturday morning, my mother and I would, we lived on the Upper West Side of Manhattan, and we would take the ferry down to South, the uh, subway down to South Ferry, the last stop on the West Side subway, and we would take the ferry that went out to Ellis Island. And I thought at that time, oh, geez, what a nice way to spend your Saturday. And I did, didn't realize that most of the other kids in my class probably didn't take the ferries on Saturday morning and go out and visit their parents in jail. Um, and it was a rather interesting I experience. Um, Can I? So something that many people are not aware of is that Ellis Island, which most of us think of as the place where immigrants first arrived and were processed, and there was a great deal, certainly, of drama about those experiences. But in 1951, Ellis Island was the place where people who were facing deportation were jailed waiting to see if they were going to be sent out of the United States. In, in that year, uh, C.L.R. James, who was a great Trinidadian Marxist, uh, C.L.R. James was imprisoned on Ellis Island. Maybe he met There's your a, father. There is a whole chapter in C.L.R. James' book about my father. Ah. In which, in which book, Gene? Oh, I should have bought Is it, because James wrote a book about it's a small Melville's book. Moby Dick while he was yes. waiting to... it's a small book. Mariner's small Renegades, Mariner's and, Renegades. And Castaways. And your father is... A chapter. It, it, shame on me that I don't remember that. I will, yeah. I have several wow. copies. Wow, I do too. We have them here. And, yeah. uh, he, wow. C.L. James talks about meeting this, this communist Martin. 
He, no, he doesn't mention him by name. This, this mm. communist who was mm -hmm. being held for deportation, and um, taught him a lot about being a humanist, being a be humanitarian about. Um, so, I will pass to this other path. A small around. world. The American Committee of Protection of Foreign Born was the organization that was created to help protect um, all these people who were being attacked and, and deported, um, and from many nationalities. My father's good friend, uh, Pete, was trying to, they were trying to deport him to Greece. Um, he had friends that were trying to be deported back to England, England Scotland. Um, the only places where they couldn't deport people were to what the, the countries that were uh, communist countries, socialist countries, uh, because those countries refused to accept American deportees for political reasons. So here's a book by Abner Green, who was my father's attorney and who was the head of the group. And I'm not going to pay the I mean, you can certainly have. One other little aside, my mother went with him on a couple of the trips that he, that he spent in Russia. Well, on her first trip there, they sort of cornered her, and because she spoke English and Russian, um, they said, and you're a teacher, and she said, yes. We want you to write a textbook for us for little Russian children to learn English. So here is the textbook that she wrote, and it's called A Reader, First Grade. It's by F. Gordon. Now, Gordon was my grandmother's maiden name. And so here's the, the reader. And um, it's, it's, it's an incredible masterwork of propaganda. It, it is just, and I'll pass it around. I have several copies of it. I can't, I can't imagine, I, I know why they kept this thing, because it's neat stuff. But you know, the height of everything. Here, here are several chapters besides, besides pages about extolling the virtues of, of Lenin and Stalin. Jimmy is a little American boy. Jimmy is a newsboy. Jimmy sells newspapers on the street. Jimmy's father is a worker. This is a first grade reader. He has not worked for a long time. Jimmy has many brothers and sisters. When his father does not work, they have nothing to eat. That is why Jimmy must work. That is why he cannot go to school. Tom the Negro Boy. Tom is a little Negro boy. He lives in America. He must work on a big plantation. He must work very hard. He works very long hours. Tom's father works on that plantation. His mother works there too. His brothers and sisters also work on the plantation. Tom has never gone to school. Schools in the South are for just the rich white people. So I'll pass this around. I think some of you will enjoy it. It's, it's sort of fraying, but that's okay. But just be, be gentle. Amazing. Amazing. <laughs> Um, after he got off the island, my father had a very, very dear friend, a good friend by the name of Meyer. Meyer was a lawyer. Meyer also came from a certain amount of money. And so what Meyer did was, with his political bent leaning and some connections he had in the agriculture business, he established something called the Consumer farmer cooperative. And what that did was, what they did was the people in the city who could not get milk easily from mm -hmm. grocery stores would get their milk from this cooperative. And what the cooperative was, there was a big milk processing plant in Belmont, New Jersey, just across the river. And um, they, the, the cooperative would gather all the milk in from these local farmers. They would pay the farmers a fair wage. The farmers would then truck the milk into Queens. In, they had their bottling plant. They put out under the consumer farmer label. They put out milk. They distributed it. To, they had the contract for several schools. They had the contract for the associated food storage. That was a left-leaning supermarket chain there's such a thing. Um, and uh, that's where my father you know, worked uh, there. At, at a certain point in the late 50s, early 60s, Dairy Lee, which is the biggest milk producing company in the New York City area, which is 
sort of 23 million people, it's just a small operation, bought out consumer farmer company. Borden's, by the way, is the second one, and Borden's just went belly up, just in case you were wondering. Um, and gave the consumer farmer company a great deal of money. And they gave them a great deal of money for all of their plant, all their stuff, all their connections, or whatever. And Meyer and Dad were sitting with a ton of money. Well, what do you do with all this money? So Meyer and Dad just sort of said, let's help poor people, which is a reasonable thing for these guys to do. And they went and formed the Consumer Farmer Foundation. And what the Consumer Farmer Foundation did was they would go up to places in the Bronx, especially the Bronx and the Central Bronx, and in several blocks on the Lower East Side. And are you familiar with the term sweat equity? <laughs> what they did was they would get buildings. Now, you got to remember, at this time, the buildings in the Bronx are being abandoned. They are being burned down by the landlords. They're kicking the tenants out and burning down the buildings, and the landlords are collecting the insurance money. And if you remember the World Series in 1973, whatever, there's Howard Cosell looking out from Yankee Stadium, looking, saying, my God, the Bronx is burning. Yeah, the Bronx is burning. They were there. All these buildings were being torched. And they took all these buildings and they gave the money to the people who still lived and wanted to work in these buildings. They reconditioned them. They rehabbed them. They, Meyer's job was going down to City Hall and leaning on all the city officials uh, to go to cut through the red tape to get all the permits and get everything else. Dad was a person who would get all these uh, various contractors and subcontractors and people together to teach these uh, people how to build their buildings and made arrangements with uh, suppliers of lumber and bricks and all the things that they needed. And many, many buildings, dozens and dozens and dozens of buildings through this uh, foundation were being rehabbed and uh, the most famous block to be rehabbed was on Kelly Street in the Bronx. And because the shape of the street was in a crescent, it became known as Banana Kelly because it was shaped in the form of a, of a crescent. And uh, he worked there. And that's where he was working at the point until, until he retired uh, when he was in his early 70s. And, and Meyer retired about a year later, and they still had money, and they had some young people who they trained to take up, and I think the organization, under a different name, I think still exists, mm -hmm. but they're still doing a lot of that now, rehabbing mm -hmm. a lot of these buildings, especially in the Bronx and in the Lower East Side. And that's what he did after he got out of jail. That, that's how he continued his activism. He couldn't work in the unions anymore, you know, so he was, they, went to, they went off in a different direction. Um, and mom went off and worked after my brother was, that was back in school. She was the office manager for a bakery and uh, she worked there. And I have wonderful stories about my mom working in a bakery. My favorite one being, she was a terrible cook. And, and her idea, you gotta remember, her idea of a balanced meal with three different kinds of bread. Um, <laughs> And she always could bring her this stuff home from, from the bakery. And so we, we never wanted, we never lacked her bread. And until I realized that most families don't. You know. Anyway. The other side I have about mom and dad into this thing was every Thanksgiving during the 50s, late 50s especially, all the people who were working in Minnesota, all the Minnesota communists, who had since moved to New York, got together every Thanksgiving. And we got together at the house of a man by the name of Lem Harris, who's a very interesting character. Mm -hmm. And he worked closely with a guy by the name of Harold Ware, and I'm not gonna tell you Harold Ware's story, but it's less than pure. Um, he, was a, he, was, he, was, he was a genuine Russian spy. Um, by the way, speaking of Russian spies and Moscow gold, my best story is I have never seen 
a penny of Moscow gold. Every time there was an event of any kind of fundraising, any kind of stuff, whatever, there was always a collection. It was always money being held close to the vest. Always whatever. If the Russians were supplying the American Communist Movement, I, we never saw any of um, Anyway, but we would meet, and there were people here who were uh, people like Lem and... Uh, a guy by the name of Eric Burt, who was the editor of the Daily Worker, Clarence Hathaway, who's the head of, uh, of the party mm -hmm. out here in Minnesota, who went, went back in New York, became the head of the New York party. And they got together and they would tell wonderful stories. And so I heard the stories of the cow on the steps and all this kind of stuff at these Thanksgiving mm -hmm. gatherings um, at, at Lem's house in the late 50s. Um, that finally ended, that kind of thing stopped because Ken divorced his, his uh, Lem divorced his wife and remarried and remarried. Well, anyway, broke the cycle, broke the whole thing. But a lot of what I knew, learned and knew about dad's experiences in Minnesota were from those Thanksgiving gatherings. So can I just steer you for a minute you to have wet your whistle? How much time do we have? Well, maybe we'll take another five to 10 minutes and then we'll see what you all want to ask or but I wonder if you would say a little bit about Camp Kinderland I and your experiences there. And now, what did you do during the summer? Well, you went to Camp Kinderland, of course. Spelled. What? K-I-N-D-E-R-L-A-N-D. Kinderland. Children's Land. What? You're going to sing Shall for us, Barry? No, no. O Kinderland, du zoi, Bedelan, und der Himmel frei. Anyway, um, and this was a camp that was founded in 1923. The first buildings on the camp were built by my grandfather. Um, and they're getting ready, according to the latest newsletter that we just got a couple of weeks ago, that everybody's gearing up for 2023, the 100th anniversary of this institution. Wow. The camp was originally organized by a group called Workman's Circle, and this was then a socialist, not necessarily communist group. And if you remember, in 1920, 1921, 22, the American Communist Party was split in all different directions. Um, there were socialists, there were social democrats, there were communists, there were Bolsheviks and Mensheviks and all this kind of thing. Well, anyway, it was the communist group, the Jewish People's Fraternal Order and their bigger umbrella order, the IWO, that, that formed Kindling. The socialists, when they broke off, the, the, the camp was located on Sylvan Lake, which was about 70 miles north of New York on this beautiful lake in Dutchess County. And Kinderlin was on one side of the lake. The socialists split off and they formed Camp Kinder Ring on the other side of the lake. And they had warm, cordial relationships. My favorite one being, one of the things you had to do was you had to show that you could swim across the lake. And when you swam across the lake, you were pretty tired. It was a pretty big lake. Well, when you landed at the dock on Camp Kinder Ring, they wouldn't let you stop there and rest. They would hit you with an oar. They would do all kinds of things. Tommy, get the hell back here. Go away. And we had to swim back across the lake and hang on to the rowboats that were going with them because it was bad, bad blood. Nowadays, it's a little bit different. There's more of a united front kind of thing, and they realize that. But my earliest memories of the camp were 1949, when I was there, I was eight years old, and it was like attending a Russian party summer congress thing. I remember, you were too young, you don't remember that. On Sundays, everybody would dress in white shirts and white shorts and we would come marching down the hills and all the different age groups would wear different color bandanas. The red bandana was this age group, the blue bandana was this age group, whatever. And that went on, and eventually I ended up in another camp called Wochika, which was an acronym for Workers' Children's Camp. And uh, there, and by the time I got back to Kindlin, it was 1954, and the reason we went back to Kindlin after these other places, 53. yeah, well, 54, you in 53, me in 54. 
was that there was a terrible polio epidemic mm. in, the, in, mm. in Mochica and, and its reiteration of Camp Cold Wyanda. And uh, that was the end of that. And at the same time, Kindlin was undergoing some difficult times uh, because of the McCarthy period. The state of New York was calling in all, all loans and mortgages and were doing all kinds of things. It, it, it was an extremely difficult time. The population of the camp, which was about 500 in the late 40s, when High Berman mm -hmm. was there, was down to about 100 at the time that, that you, you and I were there, and so on. And um, it became high risk to, to even go there. So you went to the camp, and it was also starting to lose some of its Yiddish nests, mm -hmm. mainly because there weren't enough Yiddish speakers. Mm -hmm. that, that generation was passing. Um, and it was becoming stuff more and more in English to the, to the great chagrin of, of some people and uh, problems with others. Um, and uh, that was our home turf. Why would I, what was that our home turf? Well, growing up, as I said, when I was in, in elementary school and into, and into my junior high years, you knew something was a little different about your family than all the other kids. Mm -hmm. um, and this was the one place where we felt safe. Mm -hmm. It was our safe place. Mm -hmm. We could talk about the fact of what our parents were and what they did and what they represented. And um, it was the place where the tradition, the left tradition was passed on. We learned there about unions. We learned about the Jewish history. We learned about labor history. We learned Jewish literature, much of it in translation. Mm -hmm. And there were some very good translations at this time. We learned about Shlomo Lechem and Peretz and all the great Yiddish writers in English translation. Um, and that's where we learned our songs. And I was a, a counselor there um, for a number of years. I was Barry's counselor. And then I became music director. And I had a wonderful time being music director at Kindlin because I would lead the kids every day. We'd have these gatherings and sing all the good old union songs and all the Yiddish songs and all these other kinds of things. And that's where I learned how to teach, actually, was, was doing this whole kind of thing at the age of 17 or 18, doing all, doing all this stuff. Um, and uh, eventually, uh, Barbara, and we, I started attending college, and I worked for a few years while I was in college, and I was attending dear old, I, oh yeah, I wanted to mention the other thing was, from camp to shul. Shul is the Yiddish word for school. And on Friday nights and all day Saturdays, you went to shul where you were taught in great detail every week Jewish history, literature, uh, labor history, and I have some wonderful mentors during those days, mm -hmm. a guy by the name of Ben Field, um, who taught, more, taught me more about labor history and about Jewish history, just a fantastic teacher, wonderful guy. He died many, many, many years ago. And um, after you... Oh, Moish Rauch taught me Jewish music, and, that, and I still have all of his manuscripts. That's where uh, he gave me a lot of his manuscripts. And that's where I did a lot of performing. Um, and I'll get to the music part in, in, in a little while. Um, and uh, there was a dance teacher by the name of Edith Siegel, who was the great doyen. She was a student of Martha Graham. And she was the great Jewish labor dance uh, choreographer. Uh, and if you don't think that there's radical mm -hmm. dance, Edith did radical dance. Mm -hmm. I mean, she did all kinds of fabulous dances to their once was Union May, da da da, da all kinds of things, you know. Um, and Jewish folk songs and all of those were choreographed by her. And, and she was a, a great fixture both in the show movement and the camp. But camp was our safe place. It was the, the place where we learned. It's the place where we got our first experience. Mm -hmm. As soon as you were old enough, you became a counselor and a teacher and an organizer and so on. And I stopped sort of going there sort of midway through my college career. Um, I was a you know, student 
at City College. And I want to refer to you to a wonderful new book by Matthew Goodman called The City Game. It's the story of the famous City College basketball team of 1949-50. Mm. And that was the only team in the history of the NCAA to win the NIT and the NCAA in the same year. <laughs> because there were two separate tournaments and they didn't distinguish between them. But Matthew Goodman, who I subsequently found out was a Kindle winner, mm. duh. The first 25 pages of this book are the most beautiful depiction of radical life mm. at City College. Ta -da! Um, and he calls the title of the chapter Harvard on the Hudson. And he talks about the fact that the population of City College at the time was about 70, 75% Jewish. We had our share of Irish and Italians who we let in. A few black kids because we needed them on the basketball team. Um, but this was the crown jewel of the public school system. Um, and I was a product of, of the best of the New York public schools. In the third, fourth, fifth grade, I went to what were called IGC classes, intellectually gifted children. And they were divided in parts of the city, were divided up into big school districts. And each school district had an IGC set of classes for grades four, five, and six. Now, my up part where we lived in the Upper West Side, up from north of Central Park, which is 110th Street, up to the tip of Manhattan Island, which is 215th Street, was one giant school district. It was sub-districts 13, 14, 50, and they encompassed, encompassed Central Harlem. Well, in my class, we had one black kid. I think in the other grade, there was one other black kid. New York was an incredibly fantastic bellwether school system. Mm. And those classes were, the, I mean, in the fourth grade, we learned history and geography and all kinds of things. In the fifth grade, our fifth grade teacher taught us all about music and opera and the great composers. In the sixth grade, I had a, we had a teacher who taught us all about art. And about once a month, she'd load us onto the damn subways and we would go down to the Museum of Modern Art and the Metropolitan Museum of Art, and we would spend whole days there once a month. And she taught us about every bloody painting in those museums. We knew the best that New York had to offer in all these things. Anyway, can you assure me that in the late 40s, early 50s, in the city of New York, forget this is post-Harlem Renaissance, they couldn't find enough black kids to send them to the IGC classes and, and encompass in this thing. It was a terribly segregated system. And um, unfortunately, it, it, it lasted that way for a while. Um, and it is, it is now, you know, since changed. And, and well, the, the whole class structure, IG, there aren't those classes anymore. Um, and from there, I went for a year or two to junior high, and all my friends in those classes were skipped another, I'd already skipped a year, but I, I never went to the second grade. I went from kindergarten, first grade, third grade. By the time my friends were being sent off to junior high, they had something called SP classes. And were you an sp -er? So of course, what SP meant was you did the seventh, eighth, and ninth grade in two years. But my mother said, no, graduating high school at 14 and a half was probably not a good thing. So I went there, went to junior high, and had a miserable time. I remember one of the reasons I became interested in becoming a middle school administrator was because the worst memories of my entire education experience were junior high. Horrible. The lifesaver of the whole thing was in the eighth grade, I found out that there was a high school in New York called the High School of Music and Art. And I found out that I was I knew music pretty good. I had a pretty good voice. And so I, and I was a pretty good pianist. I didn't take piano lessons and I tried out. And I got into the High School of Music and Art. And well, all the kids from the IGC classes, uh, from the uh, SP classes got to spend three years at the High School of Music and Art. I got to spend four years there. And it was in the ninth grade that a wonderful teacher I had by the name of Mrs. Dolgow said, you know, you have a nice little voice, but I think you have a bigger 
voice than that. Why don't you sing out? And she kept pushing, sing out, sing out. She discovered my voice and, and she turned me in. I was a pretty damn good singer. And all the way through high school, and it was a fabulous education at music and art. And from there, um, really kindled my interest in music, music history, uh, vocal music. Uh, it's when I had my first experiences singing opera. As a high school student, I did a lot of performing. Um, I eventually ended up at City College, which was the Harvard on the Hudson, and uh, started off pre-med. And that was probably one of the dumber moves of, of my life. Anyway, in the middle of my, uh, beginning of my sophomore year, I said to myself, after not doing very well in calculus, chemistry, organic chemistry, biology, I said, I'm probably not, not a good med student. Um, and I said, what am I good at? I, I guess music, so I became a music major. And one uh, fabulous, a lot of the professors there were refugees from, from mm. Nazi Europe. Um, and they taught music, they, they did wonderful things. And um, the only thing hanging up a hand was, uh, I'll talk a little bit about how my student activism ended while I was, was at City, was because in my senior year of college, because I'd switched from a BS degree to a BA degree, I was behind in a certain number of bachelor, B, BA track credits. Mm. So I had to take 18 credits in my upper junior and senior years and, and just rack up a whole lot of, I graduated with like 156 credits. And because, oh, by the way, City College was free. Flat out free. Hello. And because I'd passed the New York State Regent scholarship exam, I got $250 a year to cover books and expenses, which I gave to my parents and said, save this for graduate school. I'm probably going to have to go to graduate school. But it was free. It was absolutely free. And um, <clears throat> so I got extremely busy with hitting the books, hitting academics. I decided I was going to go to graduate school. At, 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 uh, my first choice was Indiana University, and I was trying to get grants to go there, and so all of a sudden I had to really work up my piano playing because you had to pass a piano proficiency exam, and I had to uh, prepare for auditions because I wanted to go into their opera program as well as their musicology program, and uh, I was busy getting married. Uh, we sort of decided that you would get married at that time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and so at, at that point, because maintaining a, a great degree of political activity during my upper years at, at, uh, at City were sort of dissipated into things. However, I was president of the Marxist Discussion Club at City College. There were many other types of discussion clubs. At City College on, two, on Thursdays from 12 to 2. They had no classes, and all of the organizations on campus could meet. And we met, and um, there was a Marxist discussion club, there was a socialist discussion club, there was the Trotskyite discussion club, there was... And the, the famous story about City was, in the cafeteria, each corner of the cafeteria, there were tables. And each different branch left-wing group had, had a table where they would argue vehemently over the various merits of Trotskyism and Marxism and Stalinism and whatever. It, it, was, it was just a bombshell of, of radical you know, activity and radical thought. Anyway, we tried to organize some stuff and there were a number of things. I did a lot of performing at that time. I was doing song leading. Here's a picture, I'll pass this around. At a, um, in November 1960, in a, in a publication, called New Horizons for Youth. We were trying to start another youth organization. So, singing to greet the 1960, uh, 15th anniversary session of the United Nations. So here I am with my guitar, standing in the street with a bunch of my buddies, who I will not identify because they're still alive. Um, by the way, I'm not, you notice I'm not identifying any names of any people who are still living. You never know where that tape's going to end up. Um, and that, that's a hangover from McCarthy days. Um, 
And here's a nice picture of Pete and I performing together at a, I think from the sign on the back, it must be the American, the Veterans of the American Links Brigade rally of some kind. Um, so I did a lot of song leading, we did a lot of that kind of stuff. And that sort of started uh, dissipating a little. During that time, the last big campus organizing event that I did was the wisdom of the great scholars <coughs> at City College were um, a couple of things. Those of us who were involved in, at that point, the peace movement, and if you remember, in 1960, this is the height of the Cold War. This is Sputnik. Had started, the, we were within a year of, of, of Cuba, the revolution, of the Bay of Pigs, of the missile, you know, all of this stuff is fermenting and going. There was a rally and the, they had, there was a ban on communist speakers. So I organized a rally and I got a thousand people to come out to that sucker. And then about a month later, the ban lifted by administrative council. Ben Davis, who was a communist speaker uh, who, and a councilman in New York from central Harlem. Ben Davis to speak here on Thursday. At that point, I said, you know, let's try and get into graduate school, pass the exams, get out of here, get married, do all that kind of stuff. And that's things sort of dissipated. At about the same time, <coughs> when, when, I, when we went out, Barbara got married, when we went out to Indiana for my master's program, that was a really tough, you know, kind of program. I spent a tremendous amount of time trying to rekindle my piano skills because I'd spent a lot of time not doing a whole lot of piano stuff. So I had to really be able to pay Bach preludes and fugues and Beethoven, you know, sonatas and Mozart berserkas and all this kind of stuff. I was constantly auditioning and doing, you know, learning opera plus musicology and uh, all this stuff and performing in the Indiana Opera Theater. Plus there was virtually no political activity whatsoever at Indiana University. Indiana University is the most sterile campus in the world. Maybe, maybe Brigham Young <laughs> is more conservative. But Indiana at the time had nothing. I don't think there was a single, not only left wing, but there's not a single progressive group of any kind at Indiana University. And I wouldn't have had time to do anything about that. That, didn't have Jewish I that was that was sheer defense by the Jewish students. They they had they had to gather together to avoid the Ku Klux Klan, which met regularly and rallied. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you remember, southern southern northern Kentucky, southern Indiana was a right. was a Klan right. organizing uh, territory. So why don't we stop there, Gene? I don't want to. Where are you out? Give me there. two. Give me two more minutes. Okay. <laughs> and I will keep it short. What happened? You know. One is by the time we got back from Indiana, the world had changed. Instead of being a folk singer, all my friends, everybody in New York, there were new guys coming in in 1962, 63, 64. A guy by the name of Bob Dylan, who came from Minnesota. I believe he was from Minnesota. Oh, yeah. Was he? Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> Phil Oaks, Judy Collins, Dave Van Ron, um, all these guys were really hitting New York clubs and doing all that stuff. And those of us who were just performers and singers and so, and were not singer songwriters. In fact, we worked at a camp up in New Hampshire during the summer of 62, 63, 64, Barbara and I, and when I first worked there in 62, I replaced a guy who was the music director there in 1961, a fellow by the name of Peter Yarrow. And um, I did not get to know Pete. I just was in contact with him and I knew a lot of stuff. And that's again where I did a lot of take teaching, a lot of stuff, a lot of so on. And uh, that's basically how I got into the ed biz and uh, slowly worked my way back and into activity and that's my story and then came well, here to Minnesota and did a little bit of schoolwork. So first let, let me ask can we show some love to Gene. And I'm, I'm, I'm a hell of an interviewer clearly. And you did. Yes. You did, I, you did wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. 
So, um, and I, I, I don't want to wear, wear Gene out, and, um, but I'd like to have some time for you to ask questions or share a short story or, um, please. Ah, good, good. Children of communists who grew up while our parents were still politically active were known as red diaper babies. And uh, red, that, that was it. Um, but it was also the context that when what became called the New Left emerged in the 1960s, yeah. and it's a really interesting, complex story because the New Left called ourselves the New Left because we were very critical of the Old Left. Yet, many of the primary activists in the New Left were the children of people in the old left or so-called red diaper babies. The, the thing, that, the thing that, that, that hurt us, didn't hurt us the most, the thing that changed us the most was the civil rights movement mm -hmm. was not kind to mm -hmm. the old left, to the communist, you know, mm -hmm. that, that group. Um, the Vietnam War was very widespread and the protesters of the Vietnam War um, were extremely broadly based, including a lot of Vietnam vets who were very much involved, involved in that. Um, and there was a hell of a lot of room for us. If you remember the 1968 Chicago Convention with all the riots in the streets or whatever, there was nobody involved in there who was old left. Who, it was all, you know, all these people who were involved in there were, were, were uh, new to the, to the movement. And the big organization on campus became SDS. Mm -hmm. Um, this was the period also of the free speech movement in Berkeley, of uh, the protests going on at Columbia University, at Harvard. Uh, well, there were five great universities that were heavily involved in the 60s and in, in, in political activity. It was Harvard City College, um, Wisconsin, Berkeley, Minnesota. and Minnesota. And, uh, those, you know, and they, they, those were not necessarily all that. Uh, left organizations, a lot of new left stuff there. Please. Oh yeah, just a couple of comments about City College. Um, I started there a few years after you left and then graduated in 67. Um, but rather than Harvard on the Hudson, uh, well I was in school there and the New York Times had an article about the history of the scholars and uh, PhDs and Nobel Prize winners that, emerged, that graduated from City College. And what they called it was a kind of proletarian Harvard. <laughs> I really like that term much better. Yeah, it was the, work, the, work, the working man's Harvard. It was the work. And while I was there, the, there, there was no tuition. At times, we had to fight back against right. that. I still have buttons that say, our position, no tuition. There were some small yeah. fees of $100 or so during the year. Yeah. Um, and what's remarkable now about the composition of the student body was still largely white, more African Americans and Puerto Ricans than maybe when you were there. But when you look at the material I get from there as a member of the Alumni Association, it's phenomenal. I mean, it's immigrants from all over the world, all over the world. and it's kids from all kinds of backgrounds, you know, native born from New York City, and it's just doing phenomenal stuff. And uh, we should still be proud of that. Absolutely proud. I mean, it's the place where I mean, the tuition there is not, it's still reasonable. I think it's it's well down. under 10 grand. I forget it, what it, it is. It's, it's, I think it's, 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 it's single, single digits. It's, well, said it's free again. It's free again. All the state colleges and universities, as of last September, are free tuition. So, I mean, it was, it was remarkable. And, and the colleges in New York, Barry went to Brooklyn, I went to City, you have the two other major university colleges, it was Hunter College and Queens College. And th those are the four senior colleges, and then you had all kinds of smaller community colleges that were all tuition free. Helen? When you were principal, when you came out here, did you in any way use your music, folk singing background, and camp singing, songwriting background as part of the school? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Former student. Yes. He's 
saying um, O Holy Night for well, Christmas. But that's, that's actually not what I had in mind. I did a little performing with the kids. I did more directing and stuff. Did I do a lot of folks? No. Th that was very foreign to the kids here. They, they were not part of that folk singing tradition uh, thing here. I, I remember a couple of times working, you know. I did much more stuff in terms of classroom teaching and doing teaching some theater, teaching literature, uh, teaching that kind of stuff rather than a lot of the, the music stuff during some of the teaching I did while I was still an administrator out here. Uh, and that helped kill my voice. One of the things I found out as a singer is you don't talk all day. And I, I was a talker, and that killed the hell out of my voice. Uh, go, go ahead, let's get another question, please. Oh, just a quick comment. I wanted to thank you because uh, some of what you said resonated. I had some parallels in my life to yours, like going to Shola, growing up in the Bronx, uh, being in the SP program in junior high school, being transformed by City College, and also going to Camp Kindering across the lake from yours. <laughs> and I had no idea about the two, that there were two camps on either side of the lake, so that was very interesting to hear. Um, and I, I also wanted to ask you a question. Uh, I, I didn't quite understand your comment about why uh, the people who were being deported uh, were not accepted into the Eastern European communist countries. You said it was about politics, yeah. but it seems like that was similar politics, so I didn't understand. No, that. they didn't want, they wanted the American communists to stay in America and work in America. They didn't, they didn't want them to What good would my father have done in Russia? He was much more important in the eyes of, of the Soviet Union for him to stay in America and work in America, in whatever capacity. Well, I guess if they were being if they were being kicked out, it seemed like they they needed to find another home, you know. But no, no, that was not so, different. So part of the strategy was to refuse to take them so they couldn't right. be deported. Right. Oh, I see. Yeah. Okay. So, ne Neil, what was I, I know that after the Spanish Civil War, a lot of communists, Russian communists, when they went back to the Soviet Union, were not treated well if they stayed alive because they were infected with Western ideas. And I'm wondering if one of the reasons is they didn't want American communists because they were infected with American ideas. There was also some very virulent anti-Semitism going on in the Soviet Union in the 30s and 40s and 50s. And uh, we knew of many cases of uh, Jews who had gone back to Russia and, and were killed as part of a very conscious uh, set of pogroms by the Stalin people against, against Jews. And uh, they, uh, they, they didn't want any Jews. Um, that, was, that, was, that, was, that was very real. Very real. There was also a, a, a cases of um, Russian prisoners of war in Austria who were deported back uh, and disappeared. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I remember at camp, we had visits by a, by a famous Russian Yiddish writer named Itzik Pfeffer. Wow. And he was a big, we celebrated him, did all kinds of stuff. Paul Robeson was with him, and they were friends. And when Paul Robeson finally got his passport back, was able to travel to Russia, he said, where's my friend Itzik Pfeffer? And never got an answer. Mm -hmm. 52. Mm -hmm. Did that, um, uh, the killing of the, the uh, Jewish intellectuals and writers in Russia, didn't that have uh, great effects on your belief in the communist system? And, and did it disillusion? It disillusion. There's a book by Vivian Gornick called The Romance of American Communism. She spends, unfortunately, a little too much time um, <coughs> gleefully talking about how American, all the American communists defected and were disaffected and were angry and whatever. Not so much. Um, most of a lot of the people <coughs> in, in my father's generation remained active. They were disappointed. My father died in 1984. I'm sure he would have been absolutely heartbroken at the breakup of the Soviet Union in 1989. But I remember having in the house things like Solzhenitsyn, The Stay in the Life from Ivan Denisovich, or some of these other books, Exposing the Gulag System. I remember he was very disappointed when Khrushchev made his speech in 1956 and exposed the crimes of the Stalin 
era. Mm -hmm. I think he was very disappointed when people came back and described in the 1930s how these great um, destructive, uh, um, what do you call it, droughts and uh, you know, terrible things that happened um, during the 1930s under Stalin. Um, on the other hand, he was very proud of what happened during, during the world, during World War II. Um, my father's sister remained in Russia. She was married to a pilot, and she lived through the war because the fact that her husband was a pilot, they deported, they moved the, the families of pilots in the Soviet Air Force into the way to the Eastern Front where they were safe from the incoming Nazis and uh, she survived the war. He didn't. Mm -hmm. She survived the war and, and still lived there for a number of years and I still have some correspondence in Russian mm -hmm. I can't read um, of her and my, my dad talking eventually. Her kids ended up emigrating to Israel and I, I still have some distant cousins in Israel who went there in 1978, 79. Somewhere around there. Please do move on. Gene, when your dad was um, on Ellis Island and imprisoned there, what did they do during the day? Do you know, did he ever talk to you about what they did? I mean, read. How long was he, he read. We were bringing him books all the time. Okay. And he was helping work with the organizing committees and, and so on and feeding them stories. He did some writing. He did other kind of stuff. It was, they, they didn't do much. It was not that intellectually engaging in the Dan Barry, please. So I'm also a camp kindler in the lung. And I can tell you throughout my lifetime, from the time I was a teenager, even to this day, activists and movements all over the country. I continue to meet people who are camp kindler in alumni. And you know, I remember I'll just tell one story. So we organized a bus to march on Washington. They left from the camp office. On the way down, um, our driver was arrested for speeding. We had to go into this little town. We had to pass the hat to bail him out. So we, in an awe-inspiring day, you all know the history. So on the way home, we stopped at a diner in Maryland, and they wouldn't serve us. So we talked it over and we decided we'd sit in. And another bus came and we talked them into sitting in with us. And about 11 o'clock that night, the proprietor, I, I'm surprised they never called the police. The bathroom was whites only because that black bathroom was out in the back. And about one, 11 o'clock, the guy takes off his apron, throws it against the wall and says, feed the sons of bitches. <laughs> we got back to New York about 5.30. <laughs> But my point is, generations of activists were trained. Values, held values that they carried with them, as I did my whole life. Uh, some of you may not know this, but one of the people who was shot and killed when Gabby Gifford was shot, mm -hmm. he'd been a counselor at Kimberly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. These were people who. I mean, generations of people who often put their life on the line. I knew one guy, Raboy. David Raboy. Sure. Yeah. He ran shotgun on shipments of food to the strikes, the coal mine strikes in Kentucky, in Hazard. I mean, these. It's, I don't know who's organizing this centennial. And 2023, but it seems it would be great to have a reunion. Of yeah, oh, yeah. Everybody oh, yeah. They're already. Yeah. Um, so I don't know, I should live so long, you know. Um, but they want to celebrate 100 yeah. years of this institution. Uh, the camp still exists. It's in Tallinn, Massachusetts. It's no longer New York. Mm -hmm. They send newsletters with kids involved, and during the summer, the kids go out and they rabble rouse in Western Massachusetts, which the people in Western Massachusetts are so, so pleased about. Um, but uh, the kids learn and, and, and the 
you know, the, the things change, the traditions. It's not in Yiddish anymore, you know, obviously there, there are no very few Yiddish speakers. Um, but the tradition, and if you know a lot about, as Barry and I do, about Yiddish literature, um, the great Jewish writers, the Peretz, the Shomalech, and the Marx Rosenfeld, the, the poets, the, the plays, the theater of the, of the uh, New York Jewish uh, theater, Yiddish theater, um, were, what do you call it, all, all people who passed on this, this thing, and now it's in, now it's in English. Uh, so. The first important writer, American Jewish writer, who reached, it was a guy named Mike Gold in his, his book called Jews Without Money. Right. That was the first novel, and, and a book by Shalomash called East River. Um, you may name Shalomash because they did the play at the Guthrie a couple of years ago called Indecent, which was about what it was called. Um, that was the first writing in English, bridging the gap. So you get to Isaac Bishop, a singer who writes primarily you know, in, in English and, and so on. So it, it, it's just a, a generational shift. Uh, I saw a picture of what you handed out. You with Pete Seeger. Do you have a Pete Seeger story? Or did you know him the way you Mr. Fair? Pete Seeger, my favorite story is he, is he used to come to camp. And he would always bring his guitar, he'd bring his banjo, and, he, and, and an axe and a log. And a log? And a log. They didn't have logs already in the day. <laughs> <laughs> and he would always, when he would gather us around and would do singing and teach them, he would always put the log on the ground and pull out this axe and do Negro work songs, splitting a splitting a log with his axe, and so on. That was, and then uh, Pete and I, we, we talked some and, and, and whatever. He he was not kind to the new generation, the Bob Dylans mm -hmm. and the Phil Oaks and other people. He was he was of a different era, and. Um, it was, it, he, he was, it, there's a wonderful new, not wonderful, it's a good book, um, recently published um, about the Weavers in the 1950s, uh, about that, and, and he was, did, did not have wonderful warm things to say about the fact that these young writers did not reflect a lot of, a lot of the old items, though they were great anti-war, Bill Oaks, I think, is one of still a great poet of the anti-war movement. As, as was early doing and so on. Um, during the I got his autograph from one of those wood chips. <laughs> on the wood chip. <laughs> that's, that's, that's better than on the axe. He, he also changed his focus too. As he, got he, he got into environmentalism and uh, you know, Hudson River movement and I mean, just so many things were changing during the early 60s as that was happening. It was, that was the era of um, the Green Revolution was beginning. Um, some of the books about that started coming out in the paperback books about uh, what the hell was the name of it? Silence. Or, or love? No. What? No, no. no, it was it was Silence. Uh, Silence. Uh, Bridge. Bridge. Well, you know, it, it was stuff that was coming. Out, and I I said to myself, I've got to mention these things, and, and that was very influential. Well, I, well, I was even in, in grad school at Columbia, um, and that was uh, the Greening of America. Um, yeah. oh. That was the uh, the general the the generation shifts, mm -hmm. uh, and all of that was was beginning, and it was a whole different. <coughs> And when I came out here, one of the things that I, that I was very excited about was the fact that the school that I was helping to, to organize, um, there was a lot of pretty progressive thinking going on among the teachers who were involved in that. Still, still is, I think, to a great degree in the district. Um, it was, it was a, it was a school district that um, 
was not a working class district for the most part, but a lot of people who represented some pretty progressive stuff, uh, and I felt pretty much at home, you know, working there. So let me suggest that we stop. Um, if you want to visit with each other or chat informally with Gene, there's no rush to leave, but um, I don't want to wear them out. Um, and, and I do want to be clear that the video that Carla has been shooting uh, will be available on, I know you're all YouTube users, but maybe this is your chance to have a relationship with YouTube. And uh, we have a YouTube channel uh, for the Eastside Freedom Library. And, and I think yes. that... Pun, I see it, is. it is go to YouTube and put in Eastside Freedom Library. It's pretty simple. Um, and, and I think that what Gene did tonight without notes, without an outline, um, was remarkable. Mm -hmm. and, and I think it's well worth getting other family members, students, friends to watch. It's only 55 um, years of teaching. It's, it's <laughs> going to watch the video. Um, it's, it's, it was just wonderful uh, to be here and listen uh, to this. And um, we may yet do other events because there's still more stories uh, to tell. So thank thank you all for coming and thank you again. For